You've been asking me for several years to talk about Stephen Wolfram's theory of everything. I haven't done that because I don't understand what he's doing. But recently, I've realized that I don't know what I'm doing either. Indeed, when I look at my newsfeed, I don't think that anyone knows what they're doing. And so I've decided to just tell you what I think he's doing. Wolfram is a computer scientist and mathematician, probably best known for the math software Mathematica. But he also has the ambition to explain, well, everything. And he wants to do it with computer code. His theory of everything is basically an attempt to put the simulation hypothesis on solid mathematical basis. He's looking for code that will produce fundamental physics as we know and like it, with gravity and the particles in the standard model. Wolfram is a curious case because he's not your average crank. He understands the mathematics he's using just fine. And yet physicists have paid basically no attention to his ideas. I'm not sure why that is, but I have a guess. His basic idea is that the universe operates like a computer program. It has very simple rules from which the laws of physics emerge. And from those laws, everything else that we see follows. It's a more difficult version of cellular automata, which you see here, that's code which produces two-dimensional patterns line by line. These patterns can become quite complex. So maybe if you did it in four dimensions, you could explain the entire universe. That's the idea. I met Wolfram once at a workshop about 10 years ago. He gave a talk about his theory of everything in front of a group of physicists. I describe their reactions as polite skepticism. You know, like when your aunt goes on about how she's met Elvis Presley in the subway and you're like, oh, interesting. Yeah, it was like that. And I have to admit that I understand the skepticism. The idea that the laws of physics are sort of computation has a rather basic problem. It's incompatible with Einstein's theories of general relativity and it's not a small mismatch. You see, any type of computation works in steps. If it doesn't, then calling it a computation is really just a weird way of talking about laws of physics that we already use. A computation has some sort of update rule. Like you see in these cellular automaton calculations, they update step by step, row by row. This means they introduce some increments of time and space. In his 22 book, A New Kind of Science, Wolfram says he wants to describe space as a network. Mathematicians also call them graphs. Both of these terms, networks and graphs, refer to the same thing, that's dots connected by lines. If you describe space in that way, it's a sort of discretization. Wolfram then says that the laws of physics are rules to update the connections in the network. That, so the idea, can both describe space and matter in it. The problem with this idea isn't just that Einstein's theories don't use graphs, but that we know you can't use graphs to even properly approach approximate them. The gaps in the graphs and the updates in time steps can't be hidden away. They'll always be observable and we haven't observed them. To see why that is so, imagine you have a photon, a single quantum of light with some wavelength. The wavelength is proportional to the inverse of the energy. What's the energy of the photon? If you don't know the answer, then you're right. The question doesn't have an answer. The energy of the photon depends on how you observe it. Suppose you observe the photon at, say, color green. An observer moving towards it will see the color shifted to the blue, so at a higher energy, and an observer moving away from it will see it shifted to the red, so at lower energy. What's the real energy of the photon? There's no answer to that. All these energies are equally real. The energy can be arbitrarily high and the wavelength arbitrarily small, or the energy can be arbitrarily low and the wavelength arbitrarily large. The reason this happens is that in Einstein's theory, the motion of the observer changes what it means for something to be large or small, or to have a high or low energy. And this is the problem with all discrete approaches to space and time. 
Say you insist that space is indeed described by some sort of graph that doesn't have structure below a certain distance that you might say is kind of the Planck length. Well, now consider an arbitrarily large structure. For each structure, there's an observer for which the size of the structure is well below the Planck length, so it shouldn't exist on your graph. As a consequence, you can't approximate general relativity with a graph while respecting all its symmetries. You can do it if you depart from these symmetries between observers, but this departure will always be large for some observer. Indeed, that people constantly got this wrong annoyed me so much I wrote a paper in which I proved that it can't be done. There's no network approach to space-time that will be compatible with Einstein's theories. Doesn't exist. So maybe you can see now why I wasn't fond of Wolfram's ideas. Now you could say, all right, but it's good that you can't reproduce general relativity because then we can test the idea. Yes, and this is why some people go and look for small deviations from Lorentz symmetry and claim that they're testing the simulation hypothesis. That makes for catchy headlines. Problem is that we know that if you take quantum mechanics seriously, even the smallest deviations from that symmetry would spill over into observable particle physics phenomena and they've long been ruled out. This is why I dare to say it's totally unsurprising that these experiments never find deviations from Lorentz symmetry. At the workshop where Wolfram gave his talk 10 years ago, this was also the major concern that physicists brought up. What's with Lorentz symmetry? How do you make this idea compatible with observation? And I think that Wolfram took this criticism seriously because a couple of years ago, he published together with some collaborators a follow-up work in which they were trying to address this issue. I read this when it came out and meant to talk about it, but this just so coincided with the first COVID lockdowns and I had other things to do, such as trying not to go insane. It also didn't help that rather than just publishing a paper like normal people, Wolfram had his PR team put out a press release in which he explains that he may have a path to the fundamental theory of physics and it's beautiful. This is probably part of the reason why physicists mostly ignore Wolfram. He doesn't follow standard procedure. I'm not saying that this is good. I'm just trying to explain what I think is going on. A lot of eye rolling, basically. The new Wolfram approach uses what they call hypergraphs. Instead of just using graphs to describe space, time and particles in them, they collect these graphs into groups. So the hypergraph is really a collection of graphs. The points in these graphs describe space time and can also describe matter in the space time depending on their properties. But the links in the hypergraphs are not physical. They have no length. They just quantify relations between the points. And since they have no length, there's no problem with them becoming shorter or longer for different observers. It's actually a clever idea. I had an exchange with a guy who works for Wolfram Research, who did most of the work, I think, Jonathan Gora, in 2020. And I came to the conclusion that this is indeed possible but it's been done before. This is exactly the idea of an approach called causal sets put forward by Raphael Sorkin. As the name suggests in this approach, space-time is a set of points, like the points in the hypergraphs. And these points have causal relations, which you can depict with arrows. So that gives you a graph. And this will indeed respect the symmetries of Einstein's theory. If you look at what they've been doing after that announcement, from 2020, they've worked more on the relation between Wolfram's hypergraphs and the causal sets. Most of this research has been done, it seems, by Jonathan Gora. He's also looked at how to use that to do general relativity and how it prevents singularities, which the causal sets people never figured out how to do. Is it a theory of everything? 
well, not yet, certainly. For one thing, I don't understand the stuff that Wolfram has written about quantum physics. It doesn't make any sense to me. There are a lot of problems with doing quantum physics with a non-quantum algorithm that he doesn't address. And he hasn't provided specifics about how to reproduce the standard model or elementary particles. However, the causal sets paper already showed that it's possible to put discretized versions of differential equations on these graphs, so maybe it isn't as difficult as it sounds. So when I look at this today, I honestly think this research program is going very well, and I think it's about time that physicists pay a little more attention to it. If you want to get started on your own theory of everything or brush up your physics knowledge, I suggest you check out Brilliant. I like working with them because they have high quality courses that fit very well with my own content. Brilliant.org offers courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. All their courses have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. Some even have executable Python scripts or videos with little demonstration experiments. Whether you want to know more about large language models or quantum computing, want to learn coding in Python or know how computer memory works, Brilliant has you covered and they're adding new courses each month. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with a course on quantum computing or differential equations. And of course, I have a special offer for users of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabina, you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days. And you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. It's an easy way to learn more and to support this channel. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.